Okay, hello and welcome one and all uh, to the latest in our BTRM webinars. Uh, my name's Ed and I do some course coordination over here, um, but more, mostly I'm here to run the tech side of things. So if anybody is having any trouble or anything like that, please do get into the chat function and let me know. Speaking of that ch chat function, um, because we're expecting to have quite a few people here, we're not going to be allowing anybody, uh, anybody to unmute themselves. So please do go into that text chat there um, and post your questions to everyone so that we make sure we don't miss any. Um, and Maura and I will be going through those and making sure that we pick the best ones for Kevin to answer at the end. Uh, speaking of Morad, over to you. Mr. Dennison, always a pleasure and thank you for the welcome introduction. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us on the latest in our ad hoc series of BTRM webinars. And uh, today's one, gosh, it's as topical as they come, isn't it? Uh, if for those of us in the UK, only a matter of a few months ago that it seemed that uh, what we had consigned to the past, very large scale swings in government bond yields, uh, had been consigned to the past, but no, no, we had a, a budget announcement from a previous Chancellor of the Exchequer. Uh, his name was Quasi Quarting, and the response to that was, um, well, let's put it this way, it was volatile. That's probably the way to describe it. And that had some implications, notably for the pension fund sector, but also for other uh, participants in the government bond market, and it re reiterated uh, 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 a technical topic of importance to banks around the world, which is counterparty risk management and the associated collateral management impact arising from the use of derivatives. Now, that's just one example of uh, where there's lesson learned for various participants. As I said, it affected more, more the uh, the pension fund industry, the banks. But we have had one or two other experiences in the past. Who of us uh, has has forgotten, probably none, the Archigos hedge fund impact on a number of uh, large bank prime brokerage services. Uh, that had some implications for counterparty risk management as well. So we thought we would present um, a, a webinar on this topic, bring us right up to date in this space. And who better to do that than our own resident faculty member, my close personal friend and colleague, uh, Mr. Kevin Liddy. And he's going to run us through just this subject, counterparty risk and derivatives, uh, lessons learned from recent market episodes. Uh, so uh, before I hand over to him, uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Liddy is a member of the faculty, as I said. Uh, he and I were also colleagues at uh, what was then called Royal Bank of Scotland Global Banking and Markets, the investment banking division of RBS. Uh, RBS is now called NatWest, and I dare say GBM is now called something else. But anyway, that's where we we that's where our antecedents go back. Um, he's going to talk us through this subject. At the end, uh, we hope to leave between 10 and 15 minutes on Q&A. Um, we will, as Mr. Dennison just said, uh, we'll go through what you've written in the chat. So if you do have a question, please type it into the chat uh, and I will uh, coordinate those and, uh, and 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 Mr. Liddy will go through those uh, in, 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 in hopefully all of them, if time permitting. Right, so further ado from me, I'm going to hand over to Kevin. Kevin, first of all, thank you again for uh, for presenting this webinar. I will hand over to you, sir, and please, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Morad. Right, so welcome to this afternoon's webinar. Um, as Morad said, my name's Kevin Liddy. I'm a BTR uh, member of the faculty. Um, I also uh, am a member of, well, I also work for Sun Financial, which is a derivatives advisory company, and we manage, you know, we, uh, we advise banks and financial institutions on counterparty risk. And I also spent um, five, six years as the uh, global co-head of counterparty risk management at um, RBS stroke NatWest. All right, so without further ado, we'll crack on. Um, the, the agenda this afternoon, it really is, is to come up with a little bit of description of what counterparty risk actually means. We'll try and define it. Um, we're particularly looking at derivatives. So with a with a counterparty risk management hat on, I will talk about CVA and DVA. We'll talk about the use of collateral to mitigate counterparty risk and hopefully then go on and see how collateral becomes a risk in its own right. Um, obviously, the market has changed. Uh, we now have much more clearing. Uh, that introduces a, a new type of counterparty risk, i.e. your risk to the CCP. And we now have the uncleared margin rules for trades that don't clear. We now have to post bilateral initial margin segregated. And again, that's collateral management and collateral risk. And then we'll look at one, two, three, four aspects of 
recent or some well in, in the exception of mf global which i put in there particularly because it was interesting to see from a ccp perspective but some recent um uh, upheavals in the derivatives market and maybe see if we can learn some lessons from them so a lot of this counterparty risk we're going to try and brush through counterparty risk is the risk that a counterparty defaults on its contractual obligations prior to maturity so there's a default risk in derivatives it's it's Derivatives have market risk sensitivities, and those market risk sensitivities obviously change over time, so therefore derivative counterparty risk is therefore dynamic, because in the event of a default, it's the unrealized positive mark to market that crystallizes into a loss, and that unrealized positive mark to market gets driven by market risk sensitivities. So what do banks do? Well, most banks do use some sort of future exposure methodology to calculate the EAD or the exposure at default. And given the loss given default, we come up with the risk parameter uh, or we think, or as a bank, we think that um, we're going to lose um, if the counterparty defaults. And from an accounting perspective uh, and actually a capital perspective, IFRS 13 requires inclusion of net counter credit counterparty risk to the counterparty in order to calculate fair value in the first place. So this means we have an introduction of an accounting concept, CVA, the uh, credit valuation adjustment, and the corresponding debit valuation adjustment, accountants like left hand, right hand. Um, my CVA is a counterparty's uh, DVA and so on. My, my CVA is a counterparty's DVA, my DVA is a counterparty's CVA. Um, is one way of thinking about it, but the fact that it is now uh, an accounting standard to include CVA in um, your um, to records. CVA is market implied, so it drives, uh, it, it is a higher level of credit reserve than using a historic probability of default because it's based on market uh, implied probabilities and it has a much higher volatility because it's sensitive to not only the market market sensitivities of the portfolio of transactions you're trying to manage with a counterparty or the individual transaction, but it also has sensitivity to credit spreads. There were significant P&L adjustments, and you can go back in history and you can look at when all the banks turned on market implied CVA and you can actually see the hit they took because going from historic to market implied is a lot higher. Obviously, it's much more volatile, so we now see CVA hedging is now a standard market practice amongst most institutions, most financial institution banks that, 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 we, that we speak to. Um, and this includes the hedging of the market risk sensitivities and the hedging of the credit spreads, and it's generally done by a CVA desk. CVA desks now manage not only the credit valuation adjustment, but also uh, funding valuation adjustment, maybe margin valuation adjustment, and are known more collectively as the XVA desks. But we'll talk about CVA for now. Now, in order to hedge the CVA, we can actually buy the underlying, you know, we can buy credit default swaps on the underlying credit, or in the event of there not being credit default uh, swap available, we use an index. And that reduces the CVA volatility through the P&L, but it introduces idiosyncratic risk because I'm mapping lots and lots of different names to one particular instance. And also, um, you know, we, we, it, it, it's a calculation of a, uh, of a, at a point in time um, a credit exposure or a cost of hedging that credit exposure, but it is not perfect and we'll come on to see that later. And of course, we have the idea that it, it moves slowly over time, but obviously we can get jumped to defaults as well, i.e. sudden defaults. Didn't want to do that. All right. Um, again, counterparty credit ratings are assigned to determine the probability of default uh, in the event of there not being a CDS market. These credit ratings are dynamic, um, it is a market, uh, it's a regulatory requirement to use observable credit spreads in calculating probabilities of default. And we can estimate that PDs by looking at CDSs or liquid indices. If we have non-observable probabilities default, then we use proxies to map to indices. Mapping of an internal, this is generally mapping of an internal credit rating to an external credit rating and creation of generic curves and mapping these illiquid counterparties to an index such as an ITRAX or a CDX. I realize I'm going quickly on this. The other thing to, to, to sort of appreciate is that how do we calculate the exposure? Well, we generally calculate the exposure using some sort of exposure simulation, normally a Monte Carlo. We calculate things such as the PFE or the potential future exposure, which is the maximum positive mark to market of a trade or portfolio of trades given some confidence level. 
We can also calculate things like the EPE, uh, which is the expected positive exposure, which is basically the average rather than some sort of maximum. And the expecting negative exposure because of your portfolio of derivatives, you know, unlike if you know if I do a loan to a particular counterparty, I know that you know they either repay or they don't repay. With a portfolio of derivatives, my mark to market can be positive. And in some situations, if the market risk sensitivities move in a particular way, the market moves in a particular way, I could have a, a negative mark to market. And the E and E or the expected negative mark to market can be calculated at the beginning, just like the EPE is, and using my own PD, I can calculate that. I can calculate DVA on that uh, using the EPE and the counterparty's probability default. I, use, I calculate CVA, and all of a sudden I have my accounting, CVA, and DVA standards. I say accounting, uh, the banks sometimes differ between account, what they do for accounting and how they do their risk management, but for now I'll say they're one for one. And I now have these volatile numbers that are going to go through the P&L and they're, they are a reflection of the bank's view at any particular time of what it would cost to hedge that portfolio of derivatives such that in the event of a default, the bank would not suffer, suffer any loss. And that's key. Because it means that CVA is now uh, a, a proxy for the risk that a counterparty has, or well, is a proxy for the risk uh, that the bank has to a particular counterparty. And it is determined by a model. And this model is lots and lots of assumptions in, and the models differ from bank to bank. Um, but it's a model number. Now, it brings some form of. Um, security acts like a security blanket shall we say because it has removed the volatility of the cva through the pnl by allowing some form of hedging to take place and everything's hunky-dory so we can have a calculate a price precise level of a cva uh, and we know that if we hedge it then as the uh, requirement of the cva requirement goes up i'll make some money on the hedge and the two will offset and i don't have any volatility in the pnl so everything's fine or is it? We'll see. Now, obviously, one thing to appreciate as well is if I have an exposure to a counterparty, then that counterparty, that exposure, as we said right at the beginning, when it when it crystallizes into if the counterparty was defaulting, then the mark to market I have of that counterparty or the unrealized PV um, will represent my exposure to default, and then my loss given default depends on what the recovery on that of that. Loss, loss actually is. Now, to mitigate that, uh, many years ago, uh, we had uh, the form of collateralization under CSAs or credit support annexes. And this meant that in, as the mark to market moved in my favor, the counterparty would post me collateral equal to the net present value. So, so at any one time, the mark to market, uh, less the value of the collateral that I held, would always equal zero. And if the, if the mark to market moved against me, I would post the collateral back. And if it moved negative, I would post collateral to the counterparty. But at any particular time, mark to market minus collateral should always equal zero. Now, that's in an ideal world. We also have this concept of margin period of risk because obviously it takes time for me to recognize that my counterparty has gone bust. Uh, he may just stop picking up the phone. He may just stop posting me collateral. Um, and it then takes me a couple of days to realize and serve notice that I'm closing him out. And then the market may move, and I may not have enough collateral because the market has moved further in my favor, and I don't have the collateral to offset that. So there is a margin period of risk that we call, and it is capitalized. To overcome that, we have this concept of over collateralization or initial margin. Um, initial margin is that it's, it's sized mathematically to cover how much the market could move in my favor over a 10-day 10 10 period normally. Uh, less with a CCP, um, how much could it move in my favor over that time, come up with a mathematical amount, and I say to the counterparty, that's how much initial margin you have to post to me. Now, this initial margin was generally when a bank dealt with a, a, credit, a less credit-worthy institution, call it hedge fund, one of the better world. Um, but we now see it much more as a standard for non-clear trades, uh, in the, with the introduction of the uncleared margin rules, if you're, a co if you're an entity that's covered by those rules, and by September of this year, I think pretty much everyone will be that has any meaningful credit, uh, any meaningful number of derivatives outstanding. Um, you, if your trades are not being cleared, um, then and they remain bilateral, then you both counterparties have to post a 
uh, bilateral initial margin to each other to be held, well not to each other, but to a custodian, it's held remotely um, and it basically is to cover this margin period of risk. There's always collateral optionality whenever we post, whenever a poster has to post collateral. Um, generally that is, um, well certainly there's collateral optionality in a, in a or there can be collateral optionality in a, a bilateral CSA because it's the collateral poster that has the choice of what collateral to post if there is an eligible collateral schedule. The difference with a CCP is that option doesn't exist because you can only post um, variation margin as cash um, to a CCP. Why are we talking about all this? Because it becomes relevant later when we actually look and see um, what happened in, in, in some of the cases that we're going to try and get through in the next half an hour. Um, obviously, CSAs and collateral are not perfect um, because there can be thresholds, it can be segregated, there can be non-standard collateral calls, there can be haircuts, there can be things like one-way CSAs, and then we also get things like difficult to repo collateral, difficult to sell collateral, as we'll currently find, as we'll see, and also concept of wrong-way risk or correlated collateral, and we'll, we'll see an example of that as well. Um, mentioned this before, um, counterparty risk, bilateral counterparty risk can be mitigated by clearing. If I have dealt with 10 counterparties and I can clear all those trades and I no longer have risk to those 10 counterparties, but I now have risk to the CCP. So use of a central counterparty can reduce bilateral um, risk, but it does put it all in the CCP. Now that can be good if, the, if my bilateral trades actually net out to a small number. Um, because I'll get that netting benefit in the CCP and that is a big positive um, compared with having lots of risk with lots of different counterparties. Unfortunately, if I'm a pension fund, um, which tends to deal one way round, then all my risk is the same way round, so it doesn't matter whether I dealt with a CCP um, or whether I dealt with my counterparties from, from, uh, from my perspective. All that matters is what is the bilateral arrangement versus what is the CCP arrangement for collateral, and we'll see that while that was important as well. Uh, use of a central counterparty, we'll do a little bit on CCP if we get the time. Uh, CCP collateral is, as I said, it's cash only, so it's slightly different. Um, the initial margin can be posted in non-cash, but there are limits uh, as to what you can post. You can't just post anything, um, so there are rules. Um, if you're a member of the CCP, you are obliged to post initial margin. You're also obliged to post to the default fund, which is sized such that if there is a default of a counterparty, um, it is a second level resource um, for the clearing member to utilize before the loss becomes mutual against all the members. And that's, that's quite important as we'll see in a minute as well. And we mentioned the uncleared margin rules. Right, so the first example, as as um, as uh, more said at the beginning, Archegos, Archegos, I think it's Archegos. I can, I, never, I can't get an exact answer. I'm sure it's out there somewhere. Um, so it was a hedge fund that had the that, that had the economic risk of being long of specific, very specific socks without actually owning the underlying shares, and they did this via. Uh, total return swaps or equity swaps, whichever you want to call them. So they use derivatives to gain exposure. So if the uh, if the uh, exposure they got they earned the economic equivalent of uh, the stock going up, and they lost the economic equivalent of the stock going down, just the same as they had uh, as, they, as if they had bought or sold the stock, but they didn't have to fork out to buy the stock. The stocks were concentrated in extremely, uh, f uh, extremely highly correlated, a few stocks in, few, in a highly correlated sectors. Um, and what they really had was the ability to uh, leverage themselves because in under a total return swap, I can buy X amount of the, of the stock or I, I can earn the return as if I had bought X amount of stock with just paying a, a fixed fee to, the, um, to the, my bank counterparty. And lots of bank counterparties wanted to get involved with this particular uh, institution. Um, and so the bank counterparties gave them the ability to leverage, but they, the, each bank counterparty had limited visibility on each of, on, on the total Archegos position. And what happened was one of the stocks dropped 25% as the investors of that particular stock reacted poorly to an equity raising, uh, and all of a sudden the stock dropped 25%. 
uh, Archegos face growing margin calls because obviously their interest rate or their uh, total return swaps uh, or equity swaps uh, were collateralized with their individual uh, banks, counterparty banks. And the counterparty banks, as the stock went down, the our traders were losing money, they had to post variation margin back to the bank. So when this became a very a bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger number, they faced increasing or growing margin calls. Our traders had to start selling the stocks in its portfolio to order to maintain to make the calls, and that added downward pressure on the stocks. So it's a it's a vicious circle. And although I chose a positive variation margin and some initial margin, when the stock stopped enough in price, those daily margin calls were not being met. And then the banks moved to close out the position. And when they close out the position, the bank sold the stock they owned as a hedge, and they further exacerbate the situation and when it sent it down even further. And in a particular cruel twist, if you want, in a conference call arranged by Oxagos to try and remedy the situation, it became clear that multiple banks were in the same situation. Then each of the banks faced a first mover advantage amongst their counterparties. So those who sold the stocks the earliest suffered less loss than those who withered, waited, withered, waited or dithered, uh, where losses were much steeper. Bloomberg has reported that Morgan Stanley traded 13 billion of these stocks and Goldman 6 billion of stocks on the March 26th. And the total reported losses from this Artegos was around about ten billion dollars. But it's five and a half, Namura two and a half, there's eighty percent. And in fact Goldman Sachs CEO highlighted the bank's propped action to avoid the losses. So what do we think of the inadequacies in the risk management framework? Well, I think there are a lot, and the good thing about the Artegos one, and I've put a, um, a reference to it in the bibliography at the end, is that Credit Suisse themselves did a very in-depth analysis of what and where their risk management failures were, uh, and it's, if anyone's interested in the topic, uh, then it's a very good resource to go and have a look. But in my view, and this isn't all of it, um, this isn't. Uh, you know, this is my view of the major risks, and there are going to be. Uh, there are others which I probably haven't mentioned. Um, but these are the v major risks or the major failures, in my view. First of all, the portfolio was highly directional and undiversified, and this should have limited the amount of leverage that the banks allowed the counterparty to have. But it became clear that. The if you look at the Credit Suisse report, that the uh, the calibration of the leverage that was allowed seems to have been more of a commercial decision rather than a prudent risk management decision. And that there therefore was internal conflict between the risk function and the relationship managers. So there's conflict between the relationship managers who want to make more money and they want to do more trades and the risk management team which says, no, yes, enough is enough or you're giving them too much leverage. A further uh, defining um, difference, I think, can be seen by the losses to, that varied between bank from bank to bank. Now, some of this is probably down to um, the ability of the um, risk management team to actually execute. So, even though there was um, maybe limited aware awareness or visibility of counterparty. Uh, well, or the counterparty risks that other banks had until perhaps that conference call, there was no inference of what the market positioning was, and you can do that by looking at stock ownership. But the ability of Goldman's and Morgan Stanley risk management systems that closed out very, very quickly, um, to me that differentiates them from some, maybe some of the others that had a lack of urgency, couldn't even implement a risk decision. Um, the con counterparty risk team maybe didn't have the mandate to act independently, and I think that was, to me, that's the big difference between the institutions that were involved um, that got out with the smallest losses compared to those that had the biggest losses. We could then look and say, well, we, all of this stuff is model related, as we, as we said in the in the in, in the preamble. So the banks had initial margin. And the banks had initial margin, that initial margin was uh, failed to cover a stress closeout. So it had an incorrectly calibrated margin period of risk. 
you could argue that the margin period of risk actually, or the calculation, uh, the calibration of the margin period of risk was actually fine. The problem was there was a cascading effect of multiple sellers, and that wasn't taken into account. So it may well have been a perfectly sized initial margin that, that the, the bank models came out with, but it doesn't take into account everybody acting at the same time, everything going in the same direction. So the stress period just wasn't anywhere near good enough. Clearly, it was too much credit advanced um, without, with inadequate client information. There were incorrect liquidity assumptions on, on how the collateral that they held would, would, would work in a fire sale, as we said. And also, in the, in the case of Archegos, Archegos, uh, KYC failed as well because the negative compliance issues were ignored. The guy had been uh, found guilty of wire fraud and insider trading in the previous five years, and yet still the banks were falling over each other to advance him lines of credit uh, and, and uh, multiples uh, of leverage. MF Global, I put MF Global in because although it happened in, you know, more than more than 10 years ago, it's interesting on a number of respects because MFG bought about $6 billion of short-dated government, uh, European government debt in the height of the European government bond crisis in 2010-11. And the purchase price of these bonds was financed to maturity by doing a fixed rate repo. A repo to maturity. So effectively, they owned the bond and they had the pricing in place, uh, the funding in place to maturity. And the yield on the bond was higher than the yield on the loan, and it was a typical positive carry trade that many hedge funds do. Problem was, is that the repo was cleared through a CCP. Now, in the end of a default, the CCP would own the bonds. And therefore, MFG was required to post daily variation margin equivalent to any fall in the price of those bonds over the lifetime of the transaction. So they're posting, so MFG are posting variation margin equal to the change in value of the bonds. Now, they already bought these bonds at a considerable discount, but during the European bond crisis, they fell even further. So they were posting variation margin. At the same time, MFG was required to post the initial margin, and that initial margin was sized by the CCP to cover the margin period of risk. And that meant that in, a, uh, in an environment where the credit ratings of the European government bonds were going down, then the uh, cost of the uh, liquidating those bonds would also impact on the margin period of risk. What would also impact on the margin period risk was the likelihood of MFG defaulting. And the likelihood of MFG defaulting was given by their credit rating. Any downgrade in their credit meant that there was more likely that there was, from a CCP perspective, there was more likely they were going to default. And so they would charge them an even more initial margin. So as well as the variation margin that was being posted equivalent to the change in the mark to market, the CCP was also able to charge an initial margin, which they could increase uh, in, in line with their rules um, as the um, uh, MFG uh, credit rating fell and also as the credit ratings of the European government bonds fell as well. And in fact, CCP, it got to such a point that MFG failed to meet the margin calls of the CCP and the CCP closed out the positions. So what do we have? And looking back at that, what do we see? Well. In this case, the CEO and the head trader of MFG were the same function, uh, and the role of the responsibility of the CRO was insufficient. This is all from a, a market report that has been published on the event. Um, the 2010 risk officer advised risk scenarios for European government bonds, which, which were dismissed by the head trader and the CEO as extremely implausible. Financing of the repo of the bonds via repo allowed deployment of leverage. It meant that you didn't have. Well, it meant that you had a compliant, a closed package. Uh, you bought the bonds, you financed them by sending them as uh, lending the bonds as as collateral, and so therefore you had the leverage in that you didn't have uh, to fund the bonds every day. Now the key thing here is the rationale for holding the bonds to maturity was ultimately proved to be correct because all the bonds repaid at par. However, the liquidity risk of the increasing margin calls was at best understated or worse, not understood at all in a period of stress. 
and the impact of an MFG downgrade on its ability to access short-term financing was also not factored into the liquidity risk of the market of the margin requirements. There was also limited appreciation of the ability of CCP to impose initial margin multipliers at their discretion in line with their rule book. The CCPs act according to their rule book and they act in the best interest of themselves. They're a profit making organization and they also act in the best interest of their members. One of the things about a CCP is if the CCP does not have enough resources of its own to close out a uh, to, to uh, OK, start again. If in the event of a default of a member, the cost to the CCP outweighs its own resources, then the uh, other members get tapped effectively for the money to make the CCP good. So that when it comes to closing out risk, there is no leeway or, or negotiating with the CCP. It can do pretty much what it wants to do uh, in line of its rule book. And that's, that's reinforced by its members because its members don't want to suffer loss mutualization as a result of a default of a counterparty. And that's a key thing to remember about CCPs. UK pension funds, how are we doing for time? Okay, yeah, 15 minutes. UK pension funds. So as Murad mentioned, um, a bit of background, UK defined, pension, uh, UK defined benefit pension fund liabilities are discounted using gilt yields. This means that the assets uh, that they own match the liability interest rate sensitivities, and this reduces deficit uh, volatility. Receiving fixed on IRSs, uh, interest rate swaps, is exactly the same from an interest rate sensitivity perspective as owning the gilts. And so a lot of banks, a lot of pension funds were uh, that couldn't afford to buy the gilts because they have a funding deficit. They need to buy more gilts. They match the interest rate sensitivity by effectively receiving fixed on an interest rate swap. And this allows leverage, as we know, derivatives allow leverage. And in 2019, the, the PPF, which is the Pension Protection Fund in the UK, found that the notional amount of leverage, notional amount of leverage amongst the top 600 pension schemes was £500 billion. Most pension funds are collateralised. Uh, they require daily uh, posting of variation margin equivalent to the changes in the value of their derivatives that they hold. Rising interest rates in 2022 required them to post a variation margin bilaterally, either under a CCP or either under a CSA, or if they had cleared their trades via a CCP, or if they had uh, a client clearing model in place, the bank would clear the trades for them. Um, the relationship between the bank effectively guarantees the relationship of the pension fund, makes the payments on behalf of the pension fund, but then receives the money from the pension fund. Um, CCP very initial margin is cash only, as we said, and so there is a problem, and it's been long identified that pension funds generally they don't have lots of cash lying around. They use those cash to buy assets because their job is to uh, invest in assets that match their liabilities. But they do run a liquidity buffer because they do know that they do have to post cash um, to a CCP or maybe cash under a CSA. So you do have liquidity buffers in place, and they also have uh, access to liquidity via bank repo debts. They they own lots of gilts, so they should be able to rate. Uh, um, they should be able to repo those gilts out and and get cash back in. And if you look back in 2022, a steady one percent rise in 30-year gilts meant that between January and July of 2022, that one percent rise uh, between January and July would allow collateral to be posted, and that collateral is measured in the hundreds of billions. And the replenishment of cash buffers in, a, in an orderly manner. In contrast, uh, the one and a half percent increase in a two-week period in September, with a one percent increase in two days, would immediately drain liquidity buffers. With subsequent collateral calls requiring this dash for cash that bordered on panic. With the dash for cash. Uh, we look to uh, the, they've exhausted their liquidity portfolio. Um, and they are they've maxed out on their um, uh, uh, guilt repos, and so what are they left? Well, they're left to sell. They're left selling cash. They're selling assets to raise cash out. As normal, you focus on the more liquid assets, which happens to be their equities and their guilt. That's their more complex uh, assets that they owned. So what this essentially boiled down to was a fire sale of 
uh, liquid assets, uh, i.e. gilts. The selling of gilts resulted in this feedback loop, sometimes called the doom loop, where gilt, gilt sales push yields higher, and that drove further collateral calls. And the, this vicious cycle only ended when the Bank of England, with the Bank of England's 65 billion emergency bond buying program, which capped yields. The sudden market moves threatened the counterparty banks. The, the counterparty banks are sitting there and say, looking at the exposure that they have to these uh, pension funds, and this brought a lot of concern. So this probably led to a reduction in credit supply to the pension schemes, either by you know, not extending cash facilities or limiting the amount of repo, and that further exacerbated the situation requiring more asset sales from the pension funds. And many pension funds, especially those with a lack of derivative experience, and a lot of the smaller ones act in a pooled manner. Um, so some of the, big, the bigger ones, you know, yeah, well-established pension funds, know what they do, oh, I could be careful, uh, have more experience uh, with derivatives, whereas some of the smaller ones act uh, when they're all pulled together and they have pooled uh, exposure. And they probably are not, do not have that level of derivative experience. And they probably agreed documentation with their investment managers that allowed the investment managers a, a huge degree of autonomy about how, how much leverage to give them and how to close out that leverage and close positions and liquidate collateral in the event of a default or breach of risk triggers. And at the same time, all the custodians got this massive amount of um, uh, instructions uh, to move collateral from funds to um, uh, investment managers or CCPs in a timely manner, and to be honest, you know, they would never have seen that level of uh, volume of collateral calls given the one percent move that we saw in two days. So, what do we think about the inadequacies in the, in the framework? Well, hedging of fund deficits using interest rate swaps allows deployment of leverage. So, we've got leverage again. Liquidity risk of margin calls would at best understated and worse not understood. We've seen that one before as well. Lack of access to sufficient liquidity in order to make the collateral calls, same thing, uh, very similar. And the failure of the liquidity that was owned to cover a stress period or an incorrectly calibrated margin period of risk. We've seen that again. But in this case, we have a slightly, uh, we have an exacerbating problem, well, same, similar to HAGOS in that uh, we have procyclicality or a doom loop or correlated collateral because they're selling the very thing that is causing them to have to sell it in the first place and we have this loop access to cash via the repo market had already been identified as a systemic weakness as to how the guilt market a guilt repo market would function in a stress market and it had been identified but no one had ever done anything about it uh, and obviously when it came to fruition it fell over well, we say it fell over, it just couldn't handle the volume. And also, you've got to remember that the counterparty banks were probably looking at this and saying, we're not extending any more credit. Because you know, uh, loans backed up with gilts, as the gilts were falling, the loans become less covered. You're calling, you're calling for more cash, or you're calling for some of the cash, but you're calling for more gilts. And it, again, it's part of the doom loop. Operational failures by custodians probably exacerbated the situation. And the regulatory margin and clearing requirements have actually increased the liquidity risk for pension funds. The forcing of, or as, as pension funds become forced to clear, um, not because they have a clearing mandate, although that's coming soon, but because there is a price differential between clearing and remaining bilateral, the banks will charge you a different price. So you're increasingly encouraged to become a bilateral, uh, to become a uh, a clearing counterparty, either via a bank or directly. If you're via the bank, then the bank just performs the function of the CCP. But you have to post cash, so there is increased liquidity risk because you cannot just post some of the assets that you own. Whereas bilaterally, you probably had a little bit more lee leeway. Right, the August 22 energy price um, problem that we saw, yeah, again, same, very, very similar. Utilities typically sell power forward using derivatives to achieve a certainty of price. They're digging stuff up out of the ground, for example. It's costing them X. They want to be able to sell it at X plus a bit. Um, they look at the forward market. It's higher than X. They sell it. 
those derivatives are either collateralized or uh, uh, bilaterally, or it's, this is done via CCP. But the fivefold increase in gas prices uh, triggered by Russia cutting gas supplies to Europe resulted in unprecedented margin calls because the, full, the price went through the roof and the utility companies had already sold it and they'd sold it effectively on margin. So they have to post margin equivalent to the loss. Even though they had the stuff here in, 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 the, in the left hand, if you want, have it in the left hand, sold it with the right hand, but that side's margin, this side isn't. So they have a liquidity problem. And in September, the Norwegian energy group Equinor estimated the margin requirement of about one and a half trillion dollars for the European energy companies. To avoid insolvencies, many European countries were forced to provide billions of euros in support to power suppliers to meet these margin calls. And they, this forced utilities and traders to secure extra funds from governments and banks to cover the margin calls, and it all became a bit of a dash for cash that we've seen before. And then and eventually, you know, some of them were actually nationalized, such as Uniper. So again, inadequacies, concentration of counterparty risk. Um, the strange one to think about, but I, I, as a I, well, as as a, a seller of the stuff that I'm digging out of the ground, I have a concentration of counterparty risk because I've sold it all, even though I own it. And that where I've sold it to, I have to post collateral. So I think about the counterparty risk as the posting of collateral in this example. And then the liquidity risk of the margin calls, again, was it best understood or worse, uh, as best understated or worse not understood? It wasn't correctly calibrated in a stress period, and there was lack of access to sufficient liquidity. Uh, and again, regulatory margin and clearing requirements have increased the liquidity risk because I now have to clear this stuff. And if I have to post stuff to CCPs, and the rules are much stricter than if I had to do it bilaterally. So as we come almost on the dot 45, um, common themes. Leverage. Well, obviously leverage is uh, leverage allows me to take more risk than I necessarily need to. So. And in lots of examples, leverage leverage counts. Risk concentrations. Um, am I an outsized market player in, in a small uh, sector of the market? Or am I advancing credit to an outsized market player in a small sector of the market? Um, large exposures. In the Archegos example, all the banks had very large exposures. And there was risk concentration. And there was leverage. Extreme market moves in stress markets, will they happen? We see it time and time again. We quite often talk about black swans. I mean, black swans aren't that uncommon. There's one in the park next to me. So I, extreme price moves happen. So stressed market moves happen. And are you calibrated to a stress market move? Don't know. Liquidity constraints. In what is where is your access to liquidity, and what is your fallback access to liquidity? In the case of a bank, the fallback, the lender of last resort is always the you know the central bank. And who doesn't have or who has access to the central bank as a lender of last resort? Banks. Who doesn't? They're immediately under a liquidity constraint because they only get it from the banks that provide them liquidity. Wrong way risk. We talk about wrong way risk. Is my collateral correlated. Um, typical example would be the pension funds. The stuff they were selling had wrong way risk because the collateral was gilts. As they sold the gilts, the gilt price went down. As the gilt price went down, their mark to market went further against them. They need to provide more collateral. That vicious circle is a classic example of wrong way risk. The margin period of risk assumptions were wrong. Uh, we, you, you can tie that into liquidity. You can tie that into closeout, because in the uh, in the event of the Archegos example, because it became a fire sale of more than one counterparty doing the same thing, um, the market moved an awful lot further than their margin period of risk would have determined, and that margin period of risk determination would have determined how much initial margin they were sitting on. Obviously, the market moved way further than the uh, initial margin that they were sitting on, otherwise they wouldn't have suffered any losses. Collateral pricing and liquidity, liquidation assumptions, it's the same sort of thing. So uh, in, in terms of, you know, am I going to be able to sell the collateral 
within the boundaries of the assumptions that I'm making or my model is making. So you could say that, you know, CCP risk, um, if I have all this bilateral risk, let's put it all in a CCP, I get the, I get the benefit of netting. But even CCPs you know, have what are, what are called margin breaches. They report now on a quarterly basis when or how many times the uh, initial margin that they've been holding was insufficient to cover the market moves that we have seen. And the number of breaches is actually very, very high. And we're talking hundreds of millions. Now, if a counterparty happened to default in that period, um, then they wouldn't have be holding enough initial margin. So you know, we've never seen the CCP go bust, but the, well, we have, but many, many years ago, um, but certainly not a, a major one, um, but it doesn't mean it wouldn't happen. CCP risk, in fact, is more likely to happen if liquidity between CCPs starts to become fragmented. Um, because you could imagine um, not only if I have all my risk in one CCP, I have a, I have the maximum amount of netting. If I have if I have my risk in multiple CCPs, I dilute the benefit of the CCP by diluting my netting benefit, and also in the event of a default, all the CCPs are going to be doing the same thing. They're all going to be liquidating my exposure, and so therefore uh, they're all going to be acting in the same direction, a la Archegos. And because this was called Know Your Risk, I put it at the end um, because there is an assumption that oh, we've done, we've got all these models and it, it quantifies what my counterparty risk is and my CVA desk manage that counterparty risk and that's fine. Now that may give you some comfort, um, but it's not perfect as we've seen. Um, every example should be looked at and learnt from uh, in, in looking at it through the lens of your own institution uh, and and the, the um, uh, assumptions that you're making need to be revisited time and time and time again. So you need to know your risk and understand your risk and not rely on the fact that a model has given me a number and that number is being hedged uh, and, and I have collateral against it. And in the old days we used to say, I oh, will do as many trades as you want because it's all collateralized. But the collateral may not be as good as you think it is and it may cost you a lot more to close it out than you think it was and you end up being an unsecured creditor or you end up suffering a loss. And if we do this again next year, we'll probably talk about ION because uh, it may not be a uh, counterparty risk, but it's an operational risk. That you know, we, if, for the, who, those of you who don't know, it's the connectivity that connects CCPs and lots of banks to each other, and it's the it's the connectivity that allows you to do all these collateral postings in the first place. And if you can't do the collateral posting because the method of making the collateral postment has gone down, um, then you're going to be in default, and then you run, run the risk of being closed out, even though you didn't do anything wrong. So maybe we'll talk about that next time. But there you go, 45 minutes. Um, very, very quick. Uh, I'm sure there's things that I missed or maybe hopefully not misspoke. But um, if there are any questions, I'll hand it over. Mr. Liddy, thank you so much for that. That was uh, that was spot on. I have to admit, I don't mind saying so. And I also laughed out loud when you referenced the Black Swan. You're going to have um, uh, members of the RSPB for those of you outside the UK, that's the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, rushing down to wherever Mr. Liddy lives so they can spot this black swan in his pond. I believe you. In fact, is it in no, I have got one. I'll, I'll, I'll post you a picture later. <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> Send me the picture. I used to be a member of the RSPB. Now, um, OK, thank you very much for that. There was every slide of uh, uh, every slide absolutely valid and spot on. I think the summary there on slide 20 really captures it nicely, especially that last bit. Um, now, we haven't had any questions posted yet, which surprised oh, me good. because I thought... <laughs> it surprised me because I thought um, it was such a topical subject and we have a number of delegates on today that there would be some questions, but there aren't. But it's OK, I have one or two and then we can close it out. First of all, this is a very... I mean, banking and finance can be seen as reasonably technical. This particular area is very technical. There are so many factors which you have highlighted that uh, risk managers, ALCO committees, indeed the C-suite, the executives, and indeed the board need to be aware of. There are so many factors. And while, as you said at the end now, you may have a number that says, here's my counterparty risk, here is the collateral I, I need. Once one factor start, one or more factors starts to get out of line, like volatile markets, you get 
as you said, black swan events, which are more common than one might think, as evidenced by the, the real live black swan in the pond in your park. So, you know, it, it seems to me that being such a technical area, it's actually quite difficult to know your risk unless one is in the specialist at the coalface. How, sh what do you think at the ALCO level, the Asset Liability Committee, the board subcommittee level, individuals need to do to make sure they know their risk? Because it's actually a very complex area, isn't it? What can they do that they aren't currently doing? Because someone like Credit Suisse or these other firms you've mentioned, they would have previously been held up to be benchmarks for risk management frameworks. And yet, as you've mentioned, a number of examples, different banks in different circumstances, they have suffered losses because they ultimately weren't aware of the risk. What can we do to increase that that know your risk um, quantum? I think that there is always an element of comfort when when you get presented with a risk report that says... No gives you a number right yeah and, and really the question is what is that number what's that number actually telling me you know is is yeah. that number a big number is it a small number and if it's a small number is it why is it that small is it because i own collateral and and therefore the risks are mitigated in some instances yes okay that's fine but what is the correlation between the exposure and the collateral does anyone ask that question what happens yeah. in the what happens in the um uh, uh, close out process yeah you know, how good is my closeout process? Yeah, I, I mean, I ran the counterparty risk team at RBS, and I would say that we learn a lot uh, in the closeout process as we did closeouts, right? Yeah. Okay. And the fact that we had the autonomy to go and do it. Once credit and legal had signed off that there had been an event of default, then our execution of the closeout was um, instantaneous. So getting the closeout period down to as short as period as possible is important. And I think that's what happened in the case of um, Goldman's and Morgan Stanley, as opposed to what happened at Credit Suisse and perhaps in the Mura. They didn't do it quick enough. So there's a whole series of things. And the other thing I would, I would add is like every time one of these happens, and let's not be... You know, let's not let's not imagine that it never happens, but it probably happens at every single institution uh, on on a regular basis. Now, the ones we've talked about have been big market wide things, um, but small defaults probably happen on a monthly basis, I would guess, at a large institution. And I think it, the purpose of the risk team or the ALCO should be to look at those and are there any lessons to be learned from that particular one and are there any lessons to be learned from the wider one maybe I wasn't even involved maybe you know I'm not one of the ones that was involved in large agos but that what are the lessons learned from that the risk report that Credit Suisse did is very good um, and yeah. I've attached it as I said uh, are there any things that I as, an, as a risk manager or on, on the board can learn from that even though my institution wasn't um, wasn't caught out shall we say but the common themes tend to be, as I said, how much leverage is there in the system or with my counterparty? Um, what is the risk concentration? How big is the exposure? Um, what is my model telling me is a normally expected move? Is it 10 basis points? What, happen, what happens if it's 100? Right? The yeah. what if scenario. So the stress, and also there's always that because some of this is, because some of this stuff is capitalized, there is always an inherent bias within an institution to make some of these numbers smaller because that means I post less collateral, uh, most yeah. capital, less capital. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. So I would, again, I would always argue that some of these numbers, I would take them with a pinch of salt when someone presents them to me. I would always be asking the question, um, what does it mean and why isn't it bigger? And what stops it from being a really big number and a disaster for me as a risk manager and institution? What is it that's stopping it being terrible? Right? And then make yourself comfortable. All the things that are stopping it being terrible are actually, in fact, true. And that's what I would say. Absolutely right. And I think that requires the individuals asking the question to have either sitting next to them or themselves know sufficient that by that, in, by the answer to the question, they'll have some degree of comfort, right? Because they're probing in the right way. Uh, you also mentioned, I mean, someone might sit back and relax because a, a exposure is collateralized, but you mentioned towards the end, collateral itself, unless it's cash collateral, may not be the quality that you think. So as, you know, in the closeout or as you're trying to recover, you know, the collateral itself will have gone down in value. And so you've got to, 
uh, a double whammy, so to speak. So even the fact that it is collateralized should force one to ask the question about the nature of the collateral, right? Um, okay, uh, we've got a question. Um, a risk must exist. Nothing for regulators to do here. Collateralization created this type of CCPWWR risk, no better, no worse than other risks. So um, thank you for that uh, comment. Um, I, I don't see a question in there, but um, I suppose, Kevin, can you see that comment there from Mihail? Uh, I can't, I can't be, it came up and disappeared. Um, okay, it says, it says, so he says, oh, no, okay. risk, risk must exist. Yeah, well, risk, 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 you know. Risk. Is there any, oh, he's asked a question. Sorry, he's asked a question. Is there anything for regulators to do here? Well, I, I, uh, I well, I thought they well, yeah, were the numbers so far. <laughs> but well, is there anything for regulators to do here? I always think that the regulators, um, the regular, as, as I try to try to infer, some of the things the regulators have done um, can have been done with good intentions but it's always the unintended consequences so a clearing mandate so giving a clearing mandate to the bank community is a good thing as long as it applies to everyone um, because you know it, 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 i don't go home with a lot of market risk so uh, as a bank so if i have dealt with 10 counterparties over the course of the day and my market risk will add up to zero. When I put it in the CCP, I've brought no market risk to the CCP. If it was left bilaterally, I'd have 10 lots of bilateral risk, right? That's the, that's, that's the view that of the regulatory view of clearing. Take it, put it in CCP, reduces bilateral counterparty risk. That's great. Doesn't work in practice because right. what have we got? we've got exemptions from the clearing mandate, pension funds large corporates, very big exemptions because they have very big market risk. Now, if yeah. that market risk is outside of the clearing element, then that means by definition there's market risk at the CCP. Second exemption is product exemption. Classic product exemption, swap versus swaption. I do a swaption, I have a delta hedge with a swap, I'm bilaterally, when I did that, I was delta neutral at point of trade. As soon as I have to clear the swap and leave the swatch in bilateral, I now have two risks that I never had before. So yeah. again, product exemption. So the idea that we are going down the route or we went down the route of CCP clearing is good, but we have to be aware of the exemptions and what that causes to the risk and the systemic risk it actually gives you that you didn't have before necessarily. You get a different, you swap one systemic risk for a different type of systemic risk. The other thing that CCPs, um, as I tried to say, CCPs were, they act in their own interest. You know, they'll close you out and they'll do whatever they have to to not suffer a loss and none of their members suffer, none of their non-defaulting members suffer a loss. So there is an, a, a sort of skew or a bias there as well. The fact that CCP variation margin is cash only, again, provides causes some of the liquidity issue that we saw for the likes of MFG and that we saw for the likes of the pension funds. That liquidity risk, I'm not sure if it needs to be there. Um, there should be a mechanism where assets are exchanged for cash at a fair price that reduces the liquidity risk that these members have uh, without being reliant on the whims of a bank desk providing you liquidity and and I think that's what I talked about when I talk about the lender of last resort. In fact, the the the, the uh, access of pension funds to the central bank repo facility uh, was discussed um, prior to the pension funds meltdown and in fact it was one of the things that the Bank of England implemented to in order to facilitate uh, liquidity rather than guilt sales and it was temporary yeah. but access so so there is there are there's always stuff to do you know i think acknowledge what what was done and the unintended consequences of what was done and perhaps there are some other things that can be done uh, on the side such as providing liquidity um, yeah well that, that last point is a very sp is specific practical example of what can be done to make it that little bit more safer. The liquidity facilities extended to other market participants, which in some cases, as you said, are very large size. Okay, thank you for your question, uh, Mihail. We are actually out of time. I had one question that's not quite connected with this, which is, uh, why on earth do certain banks provide prime hedge 
uh, prime broker funding for hedge funds. <laughs> it seems to me when I read that report that you have very handily referenced in your slides, uh, it, from, from what I could read, they were making 5%, 6% return on capital on their prime brokerage services. I'm pretty sure that their cost of equity is above that. So, but for an, a conversation for another time, I think. Uh, thank you, uh, Kevin, for your presentation. Excellent, as always. We appreciate it very much. Uh, and um, there will may well be some follow-ups, I'm sure. Um, I'm going to uh, to round out to the to the the webinar for today. Thank you for joining us, everybody. Uh, we will always be presenting ad hoc webinars to respond to market events, so please keep an eye out for them. If you have any queries, please follow up with BTRM admin. Uh, I'm going to thank uh, my presenter again, thank our host Ed, uh, and thank you to you for joining us. I wish you a pleasant afternoon. Good day, everyone. <laughs>